I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here and so mercifully scheduling me for the very beginning of the conference. Uh, it's <laughs> it's uh, really very nice and the atmosphere here is great in Bonn and the institute, so I really enjoyed myself. Uh, okay, so uh, I will talk about, so the talk will have sort of two layers. Uh, I'll talk about one concrete a uh, Ramsey theorem that appears to be new. It's a dual Ramsey theorem for trees. <laughs> and the way this theorem is proved is through an application of a uh, sort of general approach, general abstract approach to unstructured finite Ramsey theorem. So there is some machinery that I would like to also, this is the second layer, uh, explain that is used to prove that theorem. So maybe the second layer is more important in some sense because it's, it's more general if you haven't seen it before. But I will illustrate all the notions that I introduced by this uh, uh, concrete statement about trees. So uh, I will start with, uh, well, I, will start, I won't state, uh, I will not have a slide with the standard uh, the Ramsey's theorem, but I will start with two theorems that generalize it, and one is called the dual Ramsey theorem due to Graham and Rothschild, and the other one is a certain Ramsey theorem for trees. So, um, aha, so uh, a word on, on notation, so n square brackets means uh, the first n natural numbers excluding zero, so in particular square bracket zero is the empty set. Uh, so what is the dual Ramsey theorem? So let me, in first of all, let me talk about what, what are partitions. You so the Ramsey theorem, maybe I'll just say what it is. So for Ramsey theorems, you have a small number and a medium number, k and l, and you are finding a new number, big one, m, finite natural numbers, such that if you color or k element subsets of, the, of, this, of this big number m, there is a, the, a, a subset of m of, me, of the medium size, l, such that all small subset of this, of this medium, medium, medium size subset get the same color. So all k element subsets of the L element subset of, 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 of M get the same color. So uh, when we dualize, we look at partitions. So I'll later change actually the language because it will be important to state the, the, the Ramsey theorem for trees, but I will s state the dual Ramsey theorem as it is usually stated for partitions. So instead of looking so my object will no longer be subsets, but there will be partitions. So I'll have a, a set, a, say a natural number, and I'll partition it, not necessarily into intervals, just non-empty sets. So a K partition, which simply means a, a partition with K elements. Elements are required, or elements of the partitions are required to be non-empty. Okay, so I'll have a, a K partition K, and I'll call it K sub-partition of some given partition, L partition Q, if simply P is coarser, than Q. This means every element of P is uh, the union of a subfamily of Q. Right? This, is, this is all that it means. A and uh, wait a minute. is this all? Uh -huh. So the, now the theorem is stated uh, easily enough. This is Graham Rothschild. I have some number of colors D given. And I have also, just like in the standard Ramsey, I have two numbers, K and L. Think K smaller than L. Then there exists a perhaps very big number M, such that we color all K partitions of M. So all the, uh, f all the splits of M into K elements. And what I will find is, I will find an L element partition of M, such that all K subpartitions of this fixed partition get the same color, right? So I color, I have M, and I color small partitions of, of M. K element partitions. 
And then I find a medium partition with L elements such that no matter how my, how, how, in what way I make it coarser, as long as the coarser partition has K elements, I get the same color. Right? So this is Graham Rothschild. This is just a dualism. I mean, if you, the, the statement is just the same like Ramsey theorem, except when we are talking about different objects. OK, so now I want to talk about trees. This will take, a, I will have to introduce some notions. So by a tree, I'll always here mean a finite, non-empty tree. So the empty set is not a tree, and all trees are finite. By a tree, I, OK, so I mean it in the partial order sense. So this is a partial order such that it has the, the smallest element. And for each element, if I look below, it's, it's a linearly ordered set. Uh, I will not have uh, I, this, I will not have a, a symbol for the partial order on a tree. I will always talk below, above. I will use these words too, because there, there will be another order on a tree. So I don't want the, the two to be confused. Okay, but then there is an insight due to Doiber that in Ramsey situations, one looks at trees not really as relational structures, but as semi lattices with the meat operation. There will be more about it, I think, in Neodrag's talk on, on Thursday about uh, semi-lattices in, in Ramsey theory. So uh, I, when I look at, at tree for given V and W, the meat of V and W is simply the, smallest, uh, the largest element smaller than both V and W. And I really look at T with this operation. So by a morphism, I mean a function from S to T that preserves this operation. Right? So um, I will maybe draw a picture later on when I talk about embeddings. So in any case, morphism, I really look at T with as a semi-lattice in this sense. And morphism is simply morphism of, this, of the semi-lattices. So uh, in Ramsey theory, one needs to rigidify structures always, because otherwise, simply Ram the, the Ramsey theorems fail. So here is this uh, rigid, uh, a way of making this tree rigid. So uh, immediate successors of, of V in T will denote by MTV. So these are <coughs> elements that are above V, in immediately above V. V doesn't count among them. And uh, T is ordered if for each V. There exists a fixed linear order on this set of minimal successors. And this induces, this arrangement induces a lexicographic linear order on the whole tree. Right, so if I have two elements of the tree, I look at their meet, and I look at the immediate successors of the meet that precede one element and the second element. They are both immediate successors of the meet, so they can be compared using the order on the, on the uh, immediate successors. And if uh, one element is strictly above the other, that, uh, then uh, the, the one below is counted as less than or equal to the one above. Right, so, so for example, the root is the smallest element. So this order actually extends the tree order. But it's a linear order, lexicographic order on the whole tree. OK, so this is now I can introduce this main notion of embedding. So an injection is an embedding if it's an order preserving with respect to this less than or equal a morphism between trees. So here, maybe I should draw a, a picture if I find the shot. So this, I'm sorry, of, of this linear order, yes. So in particular, if I have, let's say, just a very simple tree, something like this, and another, maybe something of that sort, uh, I could map, let's say, if I map this element here, so there is an order here. And there is an order here, say so first, second, first, second. If I want to map this guy here and this guy here, that's fine. It will preserve the order. But I cannot map them the other way around. If I do it this way, as I draw, draw it here, this is not an embedding. Because the meat of these two is this point. And if I go across, the meat is supposed to be mapped on the meat of, of these two, which will have to be here. So this element has to go here. right? So this is, there are some restrictions here. This is not just an embedding of, of linear orders but, or, or tree orders, but uh, this, the preservation of meat imposes additional constraints. OK. So now I'll just say a copy of S and T is simply the image of S under an embedding from S to T. What will become later important is that a copy, so uh, this S is the image of an embedding, 
but uh, it completely determines embedding, if you think about it. So an embedding, talking about embeddings, or a copy of S is the same thing, be because I introduce this linear order. And now the theorem of Lipschitz. So there are several uh, theorems, uh, Ramsey theorems about trees. I, will, I want to talk about this one, because this one, first of all, fits with this dualization that I want to do. And it also puts the least restraints on, on embeddings. So embeddings is just, just that. There are other theorems that put more restraints on, on the embedding, and I will, not, I will not talk about this. So there is a, it's an, a theorem of, of Lieb, I believe. Uh, and it goes as follows. So for, uh, for D uh, bigger than 0 and for ordered trees ST that exist, so think S smaller than T, in particular, S, there is a copy of S and T. I mean, if there isn't one, the theorem is vacuously true. But so the non-trivial case is when there is a copy of S and T, so T is bigger than S. Then there exists a big tree V such that if you color all, uh, for each decoloring of copies of S and V, there is a copy T prime of T and V such that um, all copies of S and T prime are, the set is monochromatic. So again, there is this big tree. And I color all small subtrees of the big tree. There is a copy of the medium-sized tree inside such that all small trees inside of the medium tree get the same color. So this is a uh, leap. Uh -huh. So maybe I should say that both of these theorems that I mentioned, so one is the dual version of Ramsey, and this is something for uh, uh, Ramsey for trees. What is the year? I'm sorry? What is the year? Uh, it's uh, the 70s. It's the same year that, uh, that do, you see, I found it. He never published it. This is in a paper by Graham and Rothschild uh, uh, chapter. It's the same year in which Doiber published his theorem. So <coughs> it's 75, maybe, something like that. 70, yeah. So then why you cannot say the year without process of S at all? Uh, no, but then, uh, let's see. Look, I, 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 V has a copy of S inside. So if, you, if there is a problem with it, I don't want to go over this logical analysis now, but if, if it's a problem, assume there is a copy of S in V. Yeah. I, I I no, no, let's, let's assume that. Look, I don't want to go into it, but take S, T, assume, to think about it, I think I went over it at home, and it's fine like this. But the non-trivial case is this. Take S and T, there is a copy of S and T, additional assumption. Then there exists a V with a copy of T and V. And then this, it, it will not change the theorem, I, I, I believe. But if it does, then add these assumptions to the slide. Mm -hmm. But you're embedding it, or you search success in relation? Or? No. no, 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 no. So this is another theorem due to Fouché. You could, you could do that. There are variations of this, uh, of this Ramsey theorem for trees, but here they don't have. OK, I drew it here this way, but um, let's say there can be a point here and a point here that's still an embedding. You know, no, no, no points in, in here, no points here. I'm sorry? Even with the original, the upper right to the upper right. Upper right to the upper right, yes. Uh, I could send this one here, but then this guy would have to be sent here. This, that still would be fine, yeah. So this here, this here, and this here, that's fine. I'm sorry? The, it, 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 So the lattice operation and the meet, and it's an embedding in this. In this. So uh, successors don't need to be preserved. Uh, aha. So maybe I should say why. It's so this looks a bit like this. So I have this standard Ramsey here, and there is a, so this, there is this dual Ramsey. It's called dual Ramsey, but in fact, it generalizes Ramsey. In what sense? So if I have, uh, say, in, in dual Ramsey, what I do, I color partitions. But if I color partitions that are, let's just color partition. So given uh, you know, K and L, I find an M 
such that I color k partitions of m. So let's just color those partitions that consist of intervals. Each partition that consists of intervals really is completely determined by its endpoints. So it's determined by a subset of m. And then I can find the theorem here gives me a partition such that all subpartitions, uh, k subpartition, get the same color. Now, the partition that the theorem will initially give me will not consist of intervals. But I can doctor it. I can change it so that it consists of intervals. And then, uh, so this just gives me a subset of m. And so this will give me uh, just a Ramsey theorem through a little, just a little, little change of the resulting set in the dual case. And same with trees. So here this uh, tree, tree Ramsey. Uh, again, so Ramsey, I, I, I color natural numbers, so say elements of natural numbers. So in fact, what I could I really color is this. I have K and L, and I color K subsets of L. So this is like having a linear order K and a linear order L, and coloring all embeddings or copies of K inside of L. Right, so these are the simplest trees, just linear orders. So again, uh, I will apply, have K and L to linear orders. I apply the tree Ramsey. It will give me some bushy tree, perhaps. But then I will just project on the height. And this is the number that, uh, that will work for Ramsey. It's easy to check. OK, so they are actually, through simple arguments, they actually generalize the classical Ramsey. But what I want to do first is they talk about different things. This copy is about, talks about copies of trees, this talks about partitions. So they look like they go in completely different directions. So I want to restate the theorem first so that they, they will talk about similar objects. So first of all, I want to talk about this dual Ramsey again. So instead of partitions, one can talk about what's called rigid surjections. This is, co this is convenient, actually. It is essentially essential to, 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 to get this uh, dual for trees to restate dual Ramsey in this language. So rigid surjections are simply functions from one natural number to another natural number with the following property. That, so what is this property? If I take j, I want to, so assume I already have previous values of s. So s is some function from n to m. I have values of s up to j, but not including j. And I want to find the new value s of j. Well, it can be maybe it's just less than or equal to all the previous values. It can be then arbitrary. But maybe it's a new value. It's s of j is bigger than all the previous values. If it's bigger, it cannot be bigger than 1 plus the previous values. It cannot jump by 2 over the previous values. Right? So these are complicated functions, I, I want to say. So this is n here, and this is m. And the function, let's say, keeps going, maybe monotonous. It's increasing, and then it does whatever it wants here. So when you look from this side, it just, it's, it's a complete mess. But now it, has, uh, it would, would like to pick up a new value say at this point. It cannot jump all the way up or here. It has to check what the, the biggest value so far was, and then it picks up the value, the next value like that. OK, easy to check that the composition of two rigid surjection is a rigid surjection. I'm sorry? S1. Uh, so, okay, so S of 1, <coughs> this maximum is, then I declare it to be 0. So S of 1 has to be 1. S of 1 is 1 by convention. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's all, we always start here in the beginning. So, Premel and Voigt, they uh, realized that they made the following remark that rigid surjections from n to m are in a bijective correspondence with m partitions of n. And it's just a very simple observation. To, if I have a rigid surjection S, I associate with it the following partition. Just take the pre-images of elements in M. It will split up N into M many pieces. And, uh, but, so normally people think that, I mean, one might think that uh, surjections are in bi bijective correspondence with partitions. But that's not the case. There's more surjections than there is, there is uh, partitions. But the rigid surjections, there is precisely for a given S, we compute this PS, and PS completely determines S. And moreover, every partition is gotten in this way. But th there is more to it that if I take, say, a partition that corresponds to S, and I take a coarser partition, it's the same. It's, it will be a partition corresponding to composing S 
with some other uh, register rejection T. So take PS, look at a, a coarser partition. It comes from S composed with so, uh, some other register rejection. So taking coarser partition corresponds to taking composition. So now I just restate the Ramsey theorem. There is, there is nothing to this restatement. If you just, just look at you know, the translation, I just it's the same fact as before. So given D, given KL, there exists an M, such that for each decoloring of all rigid surjections from M to K, so this is the same as K partitions of M, <coughs> there is a rigid surjection T0 from M to L, such that, you see, T, such that all these compositions, S composed with T0, S goes from L to K, is a rigid surjection. Uh, this is monochromatic. So this, is, this should be clear that it's just a statement, right? T0 corresponds to, so given K and L, I color all rigid surjections from M to K. So all K partitions of M. I find a single rigid surjection from M to L. Uh, this, single parti this corresponds to an L partition of M, such that all coarser partition than the one associated with T0, coarser partitions with K elements, it's monochromatic. So it's just, just a statement of the previous thing. So let me maybe draw here. So the picture is as always here with these compositions. I have, uh, what do I have here? I have, uh, say, K and L. I find an M such that if I color, decolor all the uh, rigid surjections from M to K, I'll find a single rigid surjections from, from M to L, T0, such that all these compositions get the same color. And then let me state leap. Just I don't need much. I just just the remark that com, uh, that uh, copies correspond to embeddings is the same thing. So given S and T ordered trees, there exists an order tree V such that for each decoloring of all embeddings from S to V, there exists a single embedding J zero from T to V such that this is monochromatic. So here again, I color all embeddings from S to V. So this means just coloring copies of S and V. There is a single copy of T and V, right? Such that all subcopies of this, so this is a copy, its image is, some, is this T prime. Subcopies of S and T prime, these are just compositions of J0 with an embedding of S to T. This is monochromatic. So again, so here I have S, some small tree, and T, medium sized tree. There is a, a big tree V such that if I color all, decolor all uh, embeddings from S to T, so all copies of S and V, there will be a single copy here that I called, what, J0, such that all these compositions, you go from S to T, you have a copy here, you push it farther to V, it's all the same color. Okay. So now these two theorems, at least they talk about, both of them talk about functions. Both of them talk about compositions. And uh, well, the, the only problem is that composition is done in the opposite direction, right? Here I take i and compose with j0, and here is the direction is opposite. So, so this is the characteristic situation for duals. This is a dual situation. This is a direct situation. The composition is done on different sides. OK, so if this is done, now we can try to guess what will be the dual Ramsey here. So on theoretical grounds, one would expect here, let's see. So I have, this is a, a generalization of this. This is a generalization of this also. They talk about functions and compositions. So one would expect a, on theoretical grounds a theorem here that would generalize both these in the sense that it would talk about, so this talks about surjections between natural numbers. This talks about trees, this should talk about surjections among trees. And it should generalize uh, dual Ramsey in the same way as tree Ramsey generalizes Ramsey. And it should generalize uh, tree Ramsey in the same way dual Ramsey generalizes Ramsey. So sort of on theoretical grounds, one would expect something like this. But also there are these two conjectures. I cannot answer them. So there are two questions. One is from Justin Moore. He has a uh, he looked at amenability of the Thomson group. And he has a restatement 
in, in completely randomly theoretic terms of this uh, of amenability of, of Thomson's group. Now, this restatement sort of fits here. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, a statement about trees that is, uh, is like Folkman's theorem. So it's sort of a dual t statement, but it's a statement about trees. A dual statement about trees, so it's, it's something here. But the problem is I cannot answer it. So it would be, there's some complications with, with the way it's stated. There's also the, the yeah, it's, a, it's an equivalent. If it's uh, not that amenable, uh, so what would happen? Yeah, well, then, then this Ramsey fails. If, oh. if the Ramsey, if, I mean, so what's the equation? Uh, it, it would take a moment to, to explain. I mean, it's, ah. there, there's a, a, but it's a concrete Ramsey theorem, mm -hmm. and it's completely equivalent to amenability of that group. So it's if and only if. And this is, this is a theorem that is sort of of this sort. And then there is another theorem that uh, Ola will talk about, no, not a theorem, but a question, uh, due to Dana Bartoszowa and Ola Kwiatkowska. And they also need, they study something called Lelek Fan and the homeomorphism group. And they would like to compute the universal minimal flow. And again, there is a Ramsey statement of that form that is, is, it seems to be equivalent to, to being able to compute this, this equivalent. Well, I'm lying a little bit. Not, not maybe equivalent, but it's certainly needed to compute this universal minimal flow. So, uh, and again, this is this is exactly of that form, but again with different with different maps than, than than I have. So again, I cannot I cannot answer this question. But it seems that there is there is at least a need to look for theorems here. I mean, just to see if anything holds there. Okay. So let me now say what this dual Ramsey theorem for trees is. So, okay, so how to state it? So well, one can try various things, but uh, so it seems, so the thing that actually works is the following. So I have S at three, so brackets W just means everybody below W, including W. So I look at W, I look at everybody below, including W. <coughs> so this, this is the same notation as for natural numbers with square brackets. And then what I want to talk, I want to say, so I, ha I ha will have to, so I want to go to sort of dual objects from embeddings. And so in duality, you would want to change uh, image to pre-image and maybe the composition of arrows changes. So in this case, I'll, I want to just define what it means if I have two maps, one from T to S and one from, I from S to T going in the opposite direction, what it means for them to be dual to each other, for S to be dual to I. So I have, Let's see, maybe I will just show it first. And so this is as sort of simple as possible in this context. So I say S is dual to I. So I go from S to T, S goes from T to S. S is dual to I if for each W, the image of this initial segment under S is equal to the pre-image under I. Right? So images are equal to pre-images. So, so I have, I go from, Supposedly big tree T to S, maybe small tree S. I have this function S here and the function I. And what I look at is, so this is small s. I look at W here and I look at this, in, this, uh, this, this line connecting W with the, with the root. And I, what must happen is for every, every line like this, if I take the image of it under S, it's the same as the pre-image under I. Okay. I'm sorry? The same as the pre-image under I. So this is a set. I can take the pre-image of it under I. This is some set here. It should be the same as the image under S. Okay. So this turns out to be the right guess. Okay, so I'll, I'll generalize, this will allow me to generalize this notion of rigid surjection. So if I have two ordered trees, a function from T to S is a rigid surjection if it's dual to something. If there is an embedding going in the other direction from S to T, such that S is dual to I. So something is called a rigid surjection. If I can find some I going in the opposite direction, such that S is simply dual of this other thing. 
Okay, this is this is rigid surjections for, for trees. Now, uh, S completely in this situation, S completely determines I. So in fact, in this definition, I don't really need I. I can this definition can be restated in a convoluted way, avoiding completely I. Just, be just because I can define I out of S. <coughs> um, I though does not determine S. Is there's many, many S's coming with the same I. I. So it's not, this is not a symmetric thing. Of du uh, um, duality is not symmetric here. So in the case when these two trees, S and T, are linear orders, say S is K and T is L, then this notion of surjection coincide, coincides with the old one. It's just rigid surjections for, for, um, for natural numbers. And the reason is quite simple. If you have, let's say, if you have, uh, so here is, let's say, L and K. If you have this rigid surjection the way I drew it, how do you find the I? So take, so this is the rigid surjection going this way, S. How do I find the I so, so that this is true? Well, take a point here, look at its pre-image, and take the minimal element, and map this point to the minimal element. Take a point here, look at its pre-image, and map it to the minimal element. That will give you an injection, and it's easy to check that it fulfills that this S that you started with is dual to that I that is produced this way. Right? So I, I don't get, a, for, for natural numbers, I just get the, the old notion. Uh, but so one should mention that this I is much, more, much less complicated than S. S can be extremely complicated even for simple I. And then the theorem is this. Given D, given S, T order trees, there exists a, a V, at a, again, an ordered tree, such that for each decoloring of all rigid surjections from this big one to the small one, there exists a single rigid surjection from the small one to the medium one, such that these compositions, where S goes from T to S, is monochromatic. Right? So it's the same thing, the same. It's this dual picture, but now with trees, right? So it's, it's just given S and T, there is a huge V such that if I color all rigid surjections from here to here with D colors, there is a, a rigid surjection from T to V, T0, such that all these compositions uh, get the same color. OK, and then one checks by simple arguments that it actually fits here. In the sense, it gives this as a qu quick corollary for simply for linear orders and gives this as a quick corollary, to say the same as before. OK. So let me maybe, so what, what I want to talk about now, so this is this concrete Ramsey theorem that I wanted to sort of motivate and introduce. And I want to say how, how it's proved. Uh, I, I will not go into details, but it will, it will uh, allow me to talk a little bit about this, uh, the, uh, this general approach to Ramsey theory. So in this general approach, this abstract approach, there is, uh, we try to reveal sort of algebraic, formal alge algebraic structure that underlies f most of the finite pure Ramsey theorems. Uh, so the whole thing consists of of defining certain type of algebraic structures, like groups or, or rings or something of that sort. Uh, I mean, but, but no, not groups, not rings, but special structures for uh, Ramsey situations. And then one formulates within a pigeon, something called pigeonhole principle, and Ramsey statement. And then one shows, as a, the main theorem is, it shows that the pigeonhole principle implies the Ramsey statement. Pigeonhole principle implies the Ramsey statement. And then most finite unstructured Ramsey theorems, I'll have a list in a, so this is sort of, this is a vague notion here. But I mean, if you deal with these things, you more or less know which, 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 which theorems you mean by. So no, 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 there, no, there is no model theoretic struct. I mean, so here we, for example, we are dealing with trees. So one has to be a little careful. But in any case, unstructured, finite unstructured Ramsey theorem are special instances of this theorem. So this, this theorem also makes possible to prove new results like the one here. So let me just flash here the list of, of results that one can get. So the classical Ramsey theorem can be gotten from, from this abstract approach, hales jewett theorem, the graham rothschild theorem that I mentioned, versions of these results for partial rigid surjections due to void. There's a self-dual Ramsey theorem, millikan ramsey theorem for finite trees, some generalization of Doibers and Yashinsky theorems of finite trees, Spencer's generalization of graham rothschild theorem, 
And the Ramsey theorem for affine spaces, this, is, this was worked out by my student, Min Zhao, also can be gotten this way. And this dual Ramsey theorem for trees. So these are the new results, the bold-faced ones, but one also gets the, the other one. So by iterative instances, I mean this, the, this general abstract theorem is not applied once, but it's applied, you, you start with the basic pigeonhole principle, the, the Dirichlet pigeonhole principle. You apply, say, the, 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 the abstract theorem, you get a statement. Then you use this as a pigeonhole principle. You apply it again, you get a statement higher up. You can use it as a pigeonhole principle and so forth. So you, as you soup it up, you, get, you, get, you can get various statements of this sort. OK, so now the, what are these algebraic structures? So all of them will, have to, uh, will look as follows. That will be a set, a partial function. This is always a partial function from A to A a cross A to A. So its domain is a subset of A cross A. This I'll call it multiplication. There will be a function from, D to, from A to A. I'll call this function truncation. So just a function from A to A. And there will be a function, this, this, this thing, is a function from A to a partially ordered set, L with less than or equal. I'll call it a norm. Right? So I have multiplication, truncation, and norm. So, uh, this is supposed to model this composition. Uh, this is supposed to model some way of encoding induction. So when I truncate an object, I get a simpler object. And this norm is supposed to measure how complicated an object is. OK. So now, of course, as it is, it's nothing, right? But so there will be three actions. So I'll have a structure that is associated. I will assume that multiplication is always associative. This just means it's partial function. So this just means associative means there's equality between two terms. Whenever both terms are defined, the equality holds. That's the assumption, associativity. And I'll call such a thing a composition space, uh, provided it should be normed composition space. So normed composition space. If the following things are true. So there are three axioms, only three axioms. And they re relate. So there are three elements of the structure, multiplication, truncation, and norm. And these axioms relate every par, pair of, of the of the, of the structure. So the first one relates multiplication and truncation. And it just says they cooperate. So if, I, if both A times B and A times truncated B are defined, then I can compute uh, this product A truncated B by truncating A times B. So this just means multiplication uh, treats, m acts, but multiplication on the left is a homomorphism of the structure with B. So the second uh, axiom relates truncation and norm, and just says that if I truncate an element, the norm doesn't go up. So this is just, it conforms with, this, with the idea that norm measures how complicated the object is, and truncation doesn't make it more complex, make it simpler. Normally, there will be a strict less than here, but not always. So when I truncate, I go down. And the third one relates truncation and multiplication. That's the strongest of the, I mean, uh, well, Maybe most difficult to achieve, I would say. So if I have B and C, two elements of, the, of, of, of my composition space, and assume that B is simpler than C, so the norm of B is less than or equal to the norm of C, and assume that I can multiply C by A, so the complicated object can be multiplied by, uh, by A, then I can also multiply the simpler object, and after multiplying, the inequality will not change, will be the same. Right? So if the two objects simple, more complicated, I can multiply the complicated by A. I can also multiply the simple, and the inequality will stay. So these are all the axioms that are needed. There's, there's nothing else to these structures. Right? This is always, it's always these three axioms. OK. So now, what are these? So what about these, these trees? I mean, what, are the, what is the structure for the trees? So I mean, I already said that multiplication will be a composition, but one has to be a little careful with, with the way it's defined. So I have to introduce, introduce some notions. So given W and T, TW is the, I will call it the initial tree uh, determined by W, right? So if I have T here, I have a W somewhere in T. I will look at all the elements that are below W and to the left. Right? This is also, this is actually a subtree of T, as we see. So I would say this is a, an initial subtree of, of, of T. 
And now we have this funny restriction. So if I have a f going from t to s, a, a rigid surjection, I want, and I have a v here in s, v. I want to restrict the image of f to the initial tree determined by v. So to this tree. How do I do it? Well, f is a rigid surjection, so there is this injection, this embedding associated with it. I grab this embedding i, <laughs> I apply it to v, it gives me some w here, and then I restrict f to the tree determined by this w. It's easy to check that this initial tree, tw, is going to be mapped onto sv. So this restriction is, again, an uh, as a rigid surjection from TW to SV. Right, so I will need technically, I will, for technical reasons, I will need this sort of restriction. So in some sense, we are taking SV and we are taking the smallest tree here that gets mapped onto, onto this. And then, okay, so this is sort of, this is uh, important. The thing is, I cannot just define multiplication as composition. The reason is this axiom three. Uh, that I had. So if I just define this composition, uh, I will ha it will fail. It will not be the case that if I have simple and complicated uh, rigid surjection, I, I can, I, I can uh, compose with the complicated one, I will be able to compose with simple one, the simple one. I have to be careful here with how they are defined. So here is my official composition. So assume I have the following situation. I have a F going from T to S, so let me, let me write it this way. F going from T to S, T to S, and uh, G going from uh, G to, so here is F, and here is G. And aha, uh -huh, F is only defined on this initial fragment of, of T. And G goes from V to the onto the whole T. So these are the situations, these are the only situations in which I will allow two functions to be composed. So I have to have g going onto a tree, and f has to be defined on an initial subtree of t going onto s. And then the composition, I will simply look at, well, the natural thing would be to look at f composed with g, right? You go g and then f. I don't quite uh, want to do it. I will, uh, what I will do is I will restrict g to w, so I'll look at g restricted to this w, and then I'll take the regular composition. See, if I, I could take this, take simply g composed with f, this gives you some domain here, uh, right? It will not be everywhere defined because some of these elements will be mapped here, and then I cannot define the composition, but just define g composed with f and take the smallest, the largest tree lying in the domain. That would be wrong. You have to take sort of the smallest possible thing here. Take w here, move it by the injection associated with g here, look at this initial tree, and take the composition. Right. So this is what I have here. So f, this is what I wrote, f composed with gw. Now, I will write g times f for it. I will switch the notation just to to conform with the, the general notation. In the dual situation, I just have to write it in different order. It doesn't matter. OK. So <coughs> next, I, will, I have to, I have to uh, for technical reasons, I cannot just prove the theorem for rigid surjections. I don't know how to do that. I have to restrict to something called sealed surjections. And then I will, from sealed, I will lift it up to so something called sealed surjections. So a rigid surjection will be called sealed if the following thing happens. This is a, a, a mild condition, it seems, but it does take some, some work to go from sealed to arbitrary. So it's sealed if I look at the largest element. So f goes from t to s. I look at the largest uh, uh, vertex in s, so the, the largest uh, rightmost leaf. And I look at its pre-image. It has to consist only of one point. And this one point is the largest element of t, right? So I get a workout <laughs> here, lifting up and down. OK, so what is, uh, so we've got t here, and you've got s. There is an f here. 
this largest element v, the only thing that gets mapped to it is this w, nothing else. This is how we call it sealed. These are sort of normalized projections. Notice that if I take any g and I restrict, so I take w here and I look at gw, that's a rigid surjection. So these restrictions are rigid surjections even if you go from arbitrary surjections. OK, so now what is my algebraic structure? A will be just sealed surjection, seal, sealed rigid surjections. What is the multiplication? Defined above. So F and G are defined only in the situation that I described above, and it's the composition in the way I described above. OK, so what is truncation? So the truncation is if S consists only of, of the root, so there is only one point here, it's already simple enough. When you truncate, do nothing. Uh, otherwise, S has more than two vertices. Look at the second largest vertex and, uh, rest and take this restriction. So look at V, this is the second largest vertex of S, and look at this restriction. So you, you have... Uh, okay, so maybe you have S, this is the tree. Here is the largest vertex. The second largest ver vertex is going to be here. Move it here to, to, to by the prime, by the, if this is F, let's say, look at the injection associated with, move it here, and take this restriction. Right. We look at the second largest vector, uh, vector and restrict. So I'm, I'm going through it partly because, I mean, the difficulties when applying this abstract approach turn, boil down to calibrating the definitions so that these axioms are fine. They are no longer these sort of inductive, the, 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 the difficulties in this, in this argument are often how to set up induction, how you know, complicated inductions. This does not show up. What shows up is this calibrating the definitions properly. And the last one is norm. So the norm is, the, I have to say what this linear order is. This, this partial order is, that will be the image of the norm. These are all ordered trees. And S is less than or equal to precisely when S is an initial subtree of T, literally equal, not isomorphic, literally equal. So this is, by the way, a class. I will, I'm, I'm, so I have a statement here. Aha, so what is the norm? For each F, just map it to its domain. F is if something mapping a tree to another tree. Just look at what is domain. That's the norm. And one easily checks that A with these, as defined above, is a norm composition space. Uh, so actually, in actual application, I will not say how to do it, but so this is true. This is a norm composition space, but in the application, I will need, you see, this L is first of all a class. I have to restrict it to, some, to a set. And I actually, in this case, I have to do it a little bit carefully so that when I restrict to a set, you see, L is all trees. This, it's, a, it's a bit of a problem. It's too big of a, an object. I, uh, so I have to restrict it to some smaller set and this has to be done a little bit carefully so that this stays true. But I will not go through details. This, this is easy to do, but it requires some care. So now the second thing, and so now back to this general theory. Uh, Ramsey theorem is not about single objects. So it's not about uh, two rigid surjections. It's about set, sets of objects, right? So I look at set of all, uh, a, se a certain set of all partitions or certain set of all uh, subsets or in this case set of a set of rigid surjections. So in general, I will, uh, if I have a norm composition space, I will have a family of finite non-empty subsets of A. And what I will assume is that, so imagine I, on this level I have points, I have like rigid surjections, and then I look at subsets of, of these points. All these subsets are finite, they are all non-empty. And on subsets, I have an of what I would call an official multiplication. So if I have, say, a family of subsets of A, and I have two subsets here, F and G, there is a way given to me of multiplying these two subsets. This way that's given, it, it, the way it's, I mean, the, I would call such an F a family over A, provided this is given in a reasonable way. So I don't do anything funny. Means the following. That if I can multiply f by g, if this is defined, then f times g is defined for every little f from here and little g from here. And the official multiplication is just pointwise multiplication. 
So the official multiplication is just a restriction of the pointwise multiplication. <coughs> so I have two f and g, and assume I can multiply them pointwise, meaning everybody in f multiplies everybody in g. Then, in some cases, I will allow the multi some such cases I will allow this multiplication, this uh, official be, be defined, and it always has to be equal to the pointwise one. So it's just a restriction. This restriction is always, it looks like something uh, not serious, but it's always non-trivial. I mean, it's always, it's never, there's, I don't know of any example in which this is equal to the pointwise multiplication. It's always a, rest a, a proper restriction. So what is it uh, for these trees? So this is what you would expect. So uh, if I have a, uh, s let's uh, look at, the I have two trees, S, T. This is fixed. Given these S, T, I define F. F is not, not really defined, but I allow certain Fs given S and T. These Fs are f families of functions that are in A, so sealed rigid surjections from an initial tree T, subtree of T, onto S. Right? So I, I do, I'm not, so given S and T, I look at all these initial subtrees of T, and I take some rigid, rigid surjections from these initial subtrees onto, onto, onto S. Not all of them, just some. And, uh, and by the way, I, I'll put for such an f, range of f is, is this s. All, all the f's in this f have the same range, s. And the domain is this t that I started with. So the domain of f is t and the range of f. And my family f consists simply of all little f's as above. So you see, this makes sense because I want to talk about uh, functions be between, remember the, 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 the Ramsey theorem I'm talking about. So given two trees, small s and medium t, there is a tree v. And then I'm coloring all rigid surjections from v onto s. So I want to look at the family of all rigid surjections from v onto s. And I want to find a single rigid surjection in the family of rigid surjections from v onto t, such that when I compose with all elements of the family of rigid surjections from t to s, I get the same color. So this makes sense to look at this. And then what is my official multiplication. So if I have f and g, I simply, I, I allow it, f, I allow f to multiply g only if, so remember, mu multiplication here is switched. So if I multiply f, some element of f by an element of g, I actually compose element of g, precompose it by an element of f. So what must happen here, I, I, I this is defined only if the domain of g is equal to the range of f. So the functions of g are defined on the tree to which elements of f go. They have to be defined uh, on that tree. And then I allow this multiplication to be defined as a pointwise multiplication. So, and easily to check, f is a family of sets of a. So what is my Ramsey statement now? So now I want to say, OK, so, uh, so what, I, what I want to do is, let's see, I want to define the Ramsey statement and this pigeonhole principle. Okay. So how is this, is it, how, how, what, is, what does it have to be? So again, let me just draw this around this statement that I have in mind. S here, <coughs> T, and there is a V. And I want to color all these rigid surjections from V to S such that there is a single one here, so that everybody, all the, all the compositions get the same color. So I have here one family of sets, namely rigid surjections going from V to T. Here is another family, all the rigid surjections going from T to S, and the last one, family of all the surjections going from V to S. That's my situation. So what is this Ramsey statement in general? Assume I have a, a family over a normed composition space, the following condition is the Ramsey statement. So given P in my family, there is an F in my family such that I can offic officially multiply P by F. Oop. And for every decoloring of this, there is a single element of F such that this becomes monochromatic, F times P. So here, for example, I have one family. Uh, so think of P as the family of all rigid surjections from T to S. That's your P. 
F is all the rigid surjections going from V to T. That's your F. And then this has to be, I, I, will multi, I will color the composition. So everybody going from here to here times everybody going from here to here. So I color all the surjections from V to S. And then I will find a single rigid surjection here in F such that all further compositions get the same color. So this abstract statement is, in the particular situation, gives me that, what I want. So for dual trees, I just say what I just check. Condition R is just the dual Ramsey theorem for trees with sealed ridge surjections, not with arbitrary one because I just defined it for sealed ridge surjections. So uh, this is just, it's a triviality to, 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 to see that. I mean, if you just realize what F is, that's what it is, this is the Ramsey theorem. OK, so now the pigeonhole statement. Oh, I see. So pigeonhole statement. Uh, so this is the trickiest one. So the pigeonhole statement is supposed to encompass all these strange, I mean, there's a huge variety of these pigeonhole statements. So the, the abstract one has to be sort of not, cannot be similar to any particular one because they are so different from each other. So this, this statement is like the Ramsey statement R only has to be simpler. So in what way will it be simpler? So a couple of definitions, if I have A here, I can view an element of A as a partial function from A to A, namely, well, defined only on the set of x's such that AX is defined. This is a partial function because it's a partial multiplication. So I will say that A is a restriction of B if B extends A as a partial function. So uh, B can multiply more, more elements than, than A, and whatever A multiplies, uh, B multiplies also and gives the same result. So given F in A, subset of A, F A is just all the F's such that uh, F extends A. So this is just a piece of notation. And for P and Y, and this is sort of a dual restriction, P Y is all the X's that truncate to Y. So I look at Y and some X's are more complicated than that single Y. Let's collect them here. So it's F A, extensions of A, P Y, these are sort of extensions of Y in the sense that these are elements that truncate to Y. Okay. So what is going to be this P? In, in, in R, in the condition R, we color F times P, and we require the coloring to be constant on the set of the form F times P, where for some F in F. Now, I will look at, at P, and I will consider the following equivalence relation on P. I make two elements equivalent if they truncate to the same thing. So I have two elements, two rigid surjections. I sort of forget part of this one, part of that one, they have to be the same after the truncation. They may extend in different ways, but it will, uh, they will be equivalent if they truncate to the same element. Okay, and then the simpler situation would be this. If I have P, so this is my P, it splits up, so this is P, it splits up into these equivalence classes. Namely, all elements here truncate to a single element. All elements here truncate to the single element. And I would like, in my pigeonhole principle, what I will do, I will just pick a class and say, make the color constant by multiplying by an element of F, not on the whole P, but only on this equivalence class. This is much simpler. If I can do it for each single equivalence class only separately, maybe getting different colors, potentially, it's much, much better than stabilizing the color on the whole P. So this is, this is the, the point of pigeonhole principle. It looks like almost nothing happens, but in particular situations, actually, it's much simpler to check. And so the, it, it's not done for free. So the price is that F will have to behave in a certain way, certain prescribed way, this F by which I do the stabilization of the color. I will only require making it constant on an equivalence class, but there will be a price to pay. So what is the statement exactly? So we consider the following uh, criterion. That's the, the P. So here is condition P partially stated. So only stated in the, for the situation where, as if there was no price to pay. So this is just like uh, the condition R, a Gramsci condition. Given P and Y here in the, in, in the truncated P, there exists an F in F such that fp is defined, and for every decoloring for f times this equivalence class, this single equivalence class of py, there exists an element here f, 
such that f py is monochromatic. Right? So in the Ramsey statement, there is no, simply no y, and here I color f times p without y, the whole thing. And I want it, the color to be constant in f times p. So here I just stated that just make it constant, giving me equivalent, an equivalence class, make it constant on this equivalence class. But so here is the price. How instead, uh, in addition to f, I will also have an element a in a. This element a in a, I have to be able to multiply y by this element. Okay, so in addition, I will have a certain element. Not only just I have to give f, but also I have to give a, an a, such that a multiplies y. Still no price to pay because in the conclusion didn't change. But now I want f here that makes the stabilization. I want it to extend this a. This is the price that I'm paying. So that's what it is. So given f and a, so given p and y, there is an f and a such that this is defined. And this is defined. So this is defined. This is defined. And for every decoloring of f times py, just this one equivalence class, there is a single f extending the given a such that this is constant. So that's the, this is the abstract pigeonhole principle. That's what it is. I mean, and it works in, in particular situations. It looks a little foreign at first, but uh, I cannot do much about it. Uh, what I can do, I can add an A here. <laughs> because it doesn't matter if I take FA or because I, I'm picking a Fs only from FA. So this is the, the, the pigeonhole principle. It's stabi stabilizing the color on an equivalence class given by truncation. That, that's what it is, with certain price to pay. OK, so the main abstract theorem, aha. And there are some small additional conditions on the family F that I don't want to state. They are very simple. I just don't have time now. I mean, I have one minute left. So I, they are very easy to state and easy to check. I will just call them conditions A, B, C. They are conditions of the form. Take an element of the family F. This is a set. Look at all the truncations or the tr truncation of elements in this family. It forms an So S from F, take truncated S, all the truncations of element of S, this family has again B and F. It's, they are simple conditions, easy to check, easy to state, but there is no time for it. So I have a family over a norm composition space, and this family fulfills the simple conditions A, B, C. Again, simple to check and, 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 and uh, easy to state, in fact. And then if for each F in F there exists a T such that if I keep truncating F by T, I will get, at the end, one element. So for example, if I have a family of, of three rejections from one tree to another tree, if I, you keep truncating, you just chop off more and more of the tree, you end up with something just mapping the root to the root. So this is where induction uh, has its foothold here. So for each f, there is a t, depending on f. So then the pigeonhole implies the Ramsey theorem. So this is the, the main theorem. Pigeonhole implies Ramsey provided every f can be truncated down to a, a one element set. And so the last slide, what happens for the dual trees? f fulfills conditions a to c. This is easy to track. There is, there is no, no problem with it, especially they didn't say what they are. So co then condition p holds for f. Th there is some work here. So this is, this is a lemma that one needs to prove. This condition p, it's much simpler than r and can be proven, but it, it takes some work here to get this lemma. That, that f fulfills condition f. So by the main theorem, it's easy to check also that this, uh, each element of f can be truncated down to a single element, a triviality. So since p holds, a, c, c holds, r holds for f. So the main abstract theorem gives me r for f. This means the Ramsey theorem for uh, rigid surjections that are sealed. But the, and then there is another lemma, also requires some work here, that the dual Ramsey theorem for trees can be deduced from the sealed version. OK, so here what one has to work, work some more. So the dual Ramsey theorem holds uh, for trees holds. Uh, so this is it. That's all that I have to say.